So today we are going to continue in the book of Ephesians. So if you want to open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3, that's where we're going to start today. Um, last week we read chapters 1 and 2 and, and some real quick background information if you weren't here about the book of Ephesians. Um, so the book of Ephesians is a letter written by Paul to the church in Ephesus. And it's passed through many churches in Ephesus, right? Ephesus was a big city. If you remember, it's over 250,000 people in a city. So back then in biblical time, that's a lot of people for in a city, all right? So this letter was to be passed from different churches to churches in Ephesus. And in, in Ephesus, there was a lot of Greeks and Romans, all right? And there were some Jews, but a lot of them were Greeks and Romans, and a lot of them were hearing about Jesus and believing in Jesus um, because of Paul's time there um, in, in spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus. Um, one of the things that's important to know is the people in Ephesus, before they heard the gospel of Jesus, a lot of them worshiped false gods and false idols. And one of the biggest uh, temples to these false gods was found in the city of Ephesus. All right. And another important thing to understand about this letter is that Paul is writing Ephesians while he's in prison. So he's in jail, he's, and that's where he's writing this letter. You would almost not know it by the words he uses in this letter because of how like joyful Paul is, um, but, jo but Paul is in jail, and that's an important thing to understand. In chapters 1 and 2, um, Paul reminds the people in Ephesus, the Ephesians, he reminds them what Jesus has done for them. And his main point in chapters 1 and 2 is that the purpose of the cross is to unify both the Jew and the Gentile with, as one in Christ. That's the purpose of the cross, to unify the Jew and the Gentile as one in Christ. And Paul praises God while he's in prison. He writes one of the most beautiful poems about who God is in the beginning of Ephesians. All right? And then Paul tells us that we are alive in Christ, that we were once dead, but now we're alive in Christ and we're one in Christ. All right, and today we're going to jump into chapter 3. So I encourage you, if you weren't here last week, go back and read chapters 1 and 2 as you go home today. It's good stuff. But we're going to jump into chapter 3, starting in verse 1. We got a lot of reading, but it's going to be good. All right? So chapter one, verse three, nope, opposite. You guys catch that? Chapter three, verse one, all right? Could be this pain medicine I'm on too, who knows? Um, for, that reason, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the admi administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery made known to me by the revelation, as I have already written briefly, in reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Paul here in the beginning of chapter three, he mentions this mystery. He mentions the word mystery three times. And Paul, and he, the purpose of Paul's life is to reveal this mystery to the world. All right, so what is this mystery that Paul's talking about? He tells us in that verse six, right? He says, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Why is this a mystery? Why is this a mystery that Paul's talking about? To us, that sounds like it's common knowledge, right? That we can all know Jesus, like Jesus loves everyone, that's, that's common knowledge, right? This is a mystery because up until this point in, in history, if you go back to biblical times, there was, no, there was no way for the Gentiles to get over the bridge to know God, right? There was the, the, the Israelites who were God's chosen people through the descendants of Abraham. Then there's the Gentiles who were, who were not God's chosen people. And it was very difficult for a Gentile to join the Israelite group because they had to follow all of the laws of the Old Testament. They had to completely change their lives in a way that wasn't really capable of doing, right? The idea that anyone could be welcomed into the family of God was a pretty new idea to the people at this time, right? An idea that we take for granted, right? We take for granted the idea that, you know, if we want to have a relationship with Jesus, we can have a relationship with God, right? We take that for granted. That wasn't always true, right? And Paul's saying that this mystery, his purpose in life is to make this mystery known, to reveal God to the Gentiles. And he continues in verse 7, and he says, I became a servant of this gospel by the gifts of God's grace given, given me through the working of his power, Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, the grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles and boundless the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of the mystery for which ages past have kept hidden in God, he who, he who created all things. 
His intent was that now, through the church, the, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authority in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my suffering for you, which, you, which are your glory." So Paul here in this, this section, Paul knows what grace is, right? Paul, of all people, knows what grace is. If you know the story of Paul, it's a really common story that we teach in Kid Zone. We talked about it a little bit earlier. Paul persecuted Christians when he was Saul, right? Paul persecuted up to killing Christians, people who believed in Jesus Christ, right? So yet, yet God tasked Paul with sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, with the same people that he persecuted. That's grace, right? The God can use someone who was killing Christians. That's grace, and that's what what Paul was doing, right? God used Paul when all Paul deserved was death, right? If you murder someone, you probably deserve death, right? But God still used Paul, right? And that's grace. And we wonder why does Paul use words that are so, so beautiful, like when he's talking about God? Why does Paul use words that are so powerful when he's talking about God and Jesus? It's because he, is, he had experienced this grace, when someone experiences grace, right, then you're gonna, you're gonna worship that, that person who gives you that grace. And that's what Paul does with God, right? And in verse 10, there's Paul shares something that I believe is super, super, super beautiful. And it's kind of confusing. The first time when you read through it, you're like, what does that mean? I'm gonna kind of explain some of that today. So in verse 10, it says, his intent was, this, was, that, was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we're going to break that down a little bit. What does manifold mean? Manifold means varied, many, multiple colors or complex. When you look at the word manifold, you can think of a field of flowers of all different um, sizes, shapes, and colors, right? That different colors in the flowers, that's a manifold amount, right? Or you can think of a, a very ornate jacket, like Joseph's multicolored jacket, manifold, very complex and, and multiple, right? So when you read manifold here, you can think multiple, multiple, many. So God's intent is that through the church, the complex wisdom of God will be made known, and made known to who, to who. This is the part that I thought was really, incur really, really um, interesting. Made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms. So who is that? The rulers and the authorities in the heavenly realms, that's the angels, right? Both the, the good angels and the fallen angels. Those are the, who's the rulers and the authorities in the heaven, heavenly realms. So what is Paul doing here? Paul's teaching in this letter. It's something really cool. Paul is saying that the purpose of the church is to teach the angels about the complexity and magnitude of God's wisdom that is accomplished through Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of the church, is to teach the angels about God's wisdom. How are you guys not freaking out right now? That is the coolest thing ever. That God, the purpose of the church that we are a part of now teaches the angels about God's wisdom, right? That is amazing to me, right? And what this tells me is that the church is important right? The church is important. It tells me that the angels don't know everything and that they're learning about God and his wisdom by watching the church and seeing how it grows through Christ Jesus, right? That is amazing, right? That is amazing that the church universal teaches the angels about God. Then Paul tells, um, then Paul says next is that we can approach God with freedom and confidence, Right? The creator of the world, God Almighty, the most powerful, holy being ever, the creator of the world, God, right? Almighty, we can approach him with confidence and freedom. Right? Can we approach the president with confidence and freedom? No, right? We can't pro approach the president like that. Right? We can't approach anyone in power like that, really. But we can approach God, the almighty creator of the world. Why? Because he's a good father. Right, in this Father's Day, right, we talk about how God is our Father. And I'm sure for all the dads out there, you would want your kids to be able to come to you with freedom and confidence if they have anything, any need, any, any questions. Right? Your kids can approach you with freedom and confidence. And Paul says that we as children of God can approach him with freedom and confidence in the same way that our kids can approach the dads in the room. Right? How cool is that? Right? That we have a God who's such, who's such an awesome father. Right, Paul then closes out this first chapter or this third chapter in Ephesians um, with a prayer. And this prayer kind of divides um, the first half of the letter to the second half. Um, so it starts in verse 14, and it says, 
For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from who, whom every fa- family in heaven and on earth delivers its, derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your in, inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through, faithful, th- through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that suppresses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work with, with Within us, to him be the glory in the church in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In this prayer, Paul prays that we would understand how wide, how long, how high, and how deep the love of Christ is for us. And what Paul's saying in the first three chapters of Ephesians is you have to understand what Jesus has done for you. That's the most important thing that you can know is what Jesus has done for you and that his love for you is wider than you think, longer than you think, higher than you think, and deeper than you think. That Christ's love for you is more than you can ever imagine. Right? And then he finishes his prayer with a familiar verse, verse. In verse 20, he says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is, in work, that is at work within us. Right? Immeasurably more than you can imagine. Remember, Paul is in prison while writing this. Right? Paul is in prison while writing that God can do immeasurably more than you can ask and imagine. You think one of the questions that Paul would ask God was, hey God, can you free me from jail, please? Right? But that's not what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about that. He's talking about something better. Right? Paul has something even better than any riches that you could believe, um, ever desire, right? any perfect health or perfect situation that you could ever desire. It's better than that. The immeasurably more that God, he, Paul's talking about here is not according to our own desires, but according to God's power that is at work in us. We can't just take one part of the sentence and say that that's good, right? We have to read the whole thing, right? The measurably more is not according to our desire, it's according to God's power that is in work in us, right? For, for the purpose of bringing Jesus to glory in our churches and in our lives for all generations, right? The measurably more is more peace, in our lives, more love in our lives, right? More joy, more of the fruit of the spirit, the measurably more. The measurably more is generational blessings and salvation for your kids and your kids' kids. That's the measurably more that Paul's talking about here. And Paul knows that this more is so much better than anything the world could offer, right? It's even better than freedom from jail, the immeasurably more that God has for us. And my prayer is like Paul's, that we would see immeasurably more and according to God's power, Amen. All right. So now that brings us to chapter four. And we're going to see a little bit of a shift in Paul's writing style and what he's talking about here in chapter four. All right. One thing that I want you to, that's important to understand and and that you might be able to catch here is is in Ephesians chapters one through three, there are zero zip nada commands about how to live our lives. There are no, there's nothing that Paul says to do this or don't do that in chapters one through three. In chapters four through six, there are close to 40 commands of how you should live your life. That should show you that the purpose of these chapters are, are a little bit different. All right, so make sure you're paying attention to that as we read. Um, in, in chapter four, verse one, it says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live lives worthy of a calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and the Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. All right, so just there in the very first six, six verses, you can see that Paul shares some practical commands and things that we should live our lives by, right? Live lives that are worthy of living for Christ. Be humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love, keeping unity and being one as the body and one hope as one, one people called by one Lord and one God, right? Those are all things that we can do in our lives practically, right? We can all, when we know when it says be humble, we should be humble in our lives. Like we can apply that to our lives, right? Be gentle, be patient. All things that we can do in our lives to, to live lives that reflect Christ better. Paul continues in verse seven and he says, but to each one of us, grace has 
been given as Christ appoint, appointed it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attending to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Paul lays out here why Jesus gives us the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. And this is important because this tells us what I'm supposed to do, right? Paul lays out that their job is to equip the people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up, right? And this is something I think is important to understand as a church and especially the church in the United States. One of the things I think that we sometimes lose focus of is that my job as a pastor Right, my job as the pastor, the job of an evangelist, right, and the teacher is to equip God's people to do the service of God. Right? That's my job, is to equip you to do the ministry. My job as a pastor is not to do ministry. My job is to equip you to do ministry. That's my job. My ministry is equipping you to do ministry. Does that make sense? Right? So my job as a pastor is not to minister to you for you to come here and consume all my awesome like sermons, right? So you just sit here and you consume it all and you go home and you do whatever you, you want to do with your life. That's not my job, right? That's not how it should be at least, right? My job is to equip you so you come here, you can learn God's word and you can take that out with you and minister to those around you, whether that be in your families first, right? That's your first priority is ministering to your families and then to the people around you, right? I think sometimes in the church in the United States, we can be a little bit like pastor oriented where we like have all these mega church pastors that we listen to and we consume and we really like, right? And that's good. But the job of a pastor, like what Paul's saying here is to equip the body of Christ to do the service of Christ, right? And that's, that's what I want to do here is to equip you to take the message of Jesus to go out and minister to those around you, right? And this is because the church is a body, and all members of the body are important, and they help the body function in the way that it should. And Paul expands on this a little bit in, in verse 14, and he says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work, right? We need to be maturing in our faith and part of the maturing in our faith is growing in our faith, growing in our understanding and our knowledge and doing our role as the body of Christ, which Jesus is the head, Right? And this is the most important part that I think that, that we need to understand here is that Jesus is the head of the body. Right? I am definitely not the head of the, of the church. Right? I don't want to be the head of the church. That is not my role. I will never be the head of the church. I'm not qualified to be the head of the church. Right? Who's the head of the church? Jesus. Right? Who's the head of the church? Jesus. Jesus. Not me. Right? Right? No, I, if, you're, if the pastor of a church is the head of the church, right, that's the time to go to a new church right? Because Jesus is the head of the church, all right? No denomination is the head of the church, no person, no com um, committee. The head of the church is Jesus Christ, and we are the body, and we should be an active part of the body. And sometimes I think um, we like to think of ourselves as bigger than we are, right? I, maybe like I like to be like, oh, I'm the feet of Jesus, and I like to carry the word of God, right? But I think that there's something in what Paul's saying here is that the body is held together by the, and supported by the ligaments, I think there's some important part, important thing in there in the ligaments. If the ligaments are not working, the body can't function, right? If the ligaments in your hand aren't working, you can have a hand, but it's not going to be able to do much, right? You need the ligaments to be able to move back and forth, right? If your ligaments in your back decide to give out on you, you're going to be on the stage for an hour and a half not being able to stand up, right? You need the ligaments in your body to work, right? The body cannot move without the ligaments. The ligaments are a very important part of the body, they are small and they are hidden, but they keep the body moving, right? And if one of the ligaments stop working in the body, you're going to feel it, right? If one of the ligaments in my back stopped working, right, I felt that pain, 
right? If one of the ligaments stop, stops working, your body's going to feel it. And if one of the ligaments is working too hard and doing too much of the work, that's when it's going to stress and hurt the body even more, right? And the same goes for the body of Christ, right? We, we need all of the ligaments maturing and moving together as, as one in the body of Christ, that means that everyone has a purpose in the body of Christ. Everyone has a job in the body of Christ. And we all need to be working together to accomplish the mission of the body of Christ. Does that make sense? All right, so Paul continues in verse 17 and gives some more instructions for, for Christian living. And he says, so I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord that you must not no longer live as Gentiles do in the fut- futility of their thinking, They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they were given themselves over to sensuality, so they all, so, reading's hard. So as to indulge every kind of impurity and and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ, you were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former ways of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put on off falsehood, falsehoods and speak truth, truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on you while you are ang- still angry. And do not grieve, give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, because, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they, have, they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come, from, come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up, up others according to their needs that it may be benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you were sealed from the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other just as, Christ, just as in Christ God forgave you. So Paul, again, in this section, gives us some more practical ways to, to live a Christian life, right? We don't live lives like you used to live, right? Put off your old self, put on your new self, like we talked about. Take that old jer- jersey off, put your new jersey on, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, right? Put Christ on. We're supposed to speak truthfully to our neighbors. We're not supposed to sin in our anger. We're not supposed to let the sun go down on that anger, right? We don't want to give the devil a foothold in our lives. That means we don't just tip our little feet, little feet, toes in the water to feel how the water is in sin, right? Because that can give the devil a place to snatch you up in, in, in sin, right? Don't steal. Work hard. Um, don't speak unwholesome words. Build each other up with your words. Don't tear each other down, right? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Get rid of bitterness and rage and anger and brawling, slander and malice. Be kind and compassionate, forgiving as Christ forgives you, right? He lists all these practical things um, for living a life that reflects God, And I think sometimes as Christians, we focus on these things, right? These things that you're supposed to do and you're not supposed to do, and we forget why we do the things we do, right? I think sometimes if you're, you know, raising kids, I don't know yet, I'm excited. We have three more weeks maybe, right? And I get to be a dad, and I want to teach my my daughter to do all these things. But I think what Paul's saying here in the book of Ephesians is we need to know why we do these things in order to do them the way that reflects God the most. And that's what I think he lays out in the first verse of chapter five. He says, following God's example, therefore as dearly loved children and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offerance and sacrifice to God, right? In this, this verse right here, Paul is laying out what I believe is one of the main things of this message, right? He's saying, follow God's example, right? As dearly loved children of God. Who, who is he talking to? Us, the children of God. That's who we are. What should we do? Walk in the way of love. Because we are children of God, we should walk in the way of love. And why should we do that, right? Because Christ loves us and he gave himself, us, his, he gave himself up for us. That's why we should do all of these commands that Paul's talking about, right? Paul begins his letter with three chapters explaining what Jesus has done for you, 
He doesn't explain, start the letter by explaining how you should live, what you're doing wrong, what you need to do better, what you need to get better at. He doesn't start his letter at, like that. He starts by explaining what Jesus has done for you, why Jesus is awesome, why we, he's worthy of our praise, right? How we can be one, right? He begins his letter like that, that we both Jew and Gentile can become children of God through Jesus Christ. And because of that, because of what Jesus has done, right, we should walk in love, not to receive anything, not, not to get something better, right? But because Jesus loved us and gave himself for us. One of the things that's kind of interesting is that every other religion, you are supposed to live a certain way to receive something. You live a certain way and you can receive salvation. You live a certain way and you can receive something else, something good. You can receive a prize. That's not what Christianity says. Christianity says, you believe in Jesus, you will receive salvation. And because of that salvation that you received, you should live in a way that reflects God and honors Jesus, right? And we need to understand that because we are freely forgiven in Christ, that's the gift of salvation. That's why we live our lives the way we do, right? So the worship team wants to come forward. I think that's something that we need to understand more and more is the way, the reason that we do what we do is not to get something, it's not to receive um, an ex extra special gift, it's to reflect Jesus and what he's done for us. In, in chapter five, in verse 19, if you skip down a little bit, there's a verse I wanted to read today before we, we close in worship. And it says, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs of the spirit, sing and make music from your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Something that I think is so important is the worship. Our lives need to be a reflection of worship, an overflow of worship, right? When we understand what Jesus has done for us, that he died on the cross, that he rose again on the third day, and that he gives us a way to the almighty God, that we can have a relationship, a personal relationship with the one true God. When we understand that, our lives should be an overflow of worship. And out of that overflow of worship should come our actions. Our actions should be an overflow of worship. That's why we love each other. That's why we're kind to people. That's why we show compassion. It's as an overflow of our worship to God. Um, God, we just love you so much. God, I thank you that you are good. God, we thank you for giving your son to die for us, giving us a way to be with you forever. God, I thank you for the unity that comes through the cross, God, that we can be one um, with each other and with you. God, I pray that our actions would be an overflow of that salvation that comes through you. God, I pray that we would worship you in a way that you are worthy of our worship and that we would give, give, give you all of our lives today, God. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.